Hey guys, welcome back to Orncleft, the game of money. Uh, don't forget the game of money is sponsored by Asher's Pancakes. Asher's Pancakes is a delicious flaxseed pancake made by Amalia Claff every morning for Asher Claff in our household. Unfortunately, the supply of those pancakes is five a day. By the time I get to the breakfast table, they're all gone. No, this podcast is not sponsored by anybody but me, but I will tell you the story of Asher's Pancakes is true. In the morning, if I smell the rich aroma of pancakes cooking, what's pretty clear <laughs> is they're made for my son. By the time I get to the breakfast table, there's none left. He's a hockey player. He eats everything in sight. But we have no green things. We're not sponsored by Select Blinds. We don't have uh, pancakes with flax seeds. We don't have insurance. We don't have Boost Mobile. We don't have anybody but me paying the bills. So that's why I get to tell the stories that I like to tell. For about a year, Let's see, I would say 2020, 2021. We had a couple of deals where we were tightening up, but I didn't have a lot of deals that I was doing myself. And so I was doing a lot of content. What's interesting, by the way, what are we talking about today? Frames. We're going to talk about frames. This is old school pitch anything. If you have not read chapter two in pitch anything, hit pause, go read that, and don't, don't even come back. That is everything. Chapter two in pitch anything, frames and framing was such a breakthrough for me to have written it and then be able to execute it from a blueprint. What a lot of people don't know is Pitch Anything is not only you know, a book I wrote, people love it, but it's my personal blueprint for how to conduct uh, yourself inside of deals to control them. So I wrote the thing that I had to do and commit to, Pitch Anything Frames Frame Control. And so I was producing a lot of content during those years. And so you start thinking a lot of framing, framing in terms of actual frame, the window frame. Like you get on a Zoom call, you get on a content call, you're making a video. What are people seeing? Uh, everything from Mr. Beast down to some of the most well-known YouTube content professionals or content creators are always thinking about framing. What do you see? Who else is thinking about that? Everybody holds a camera. If you're in Hollywood and you're a producer, you're a DP, you are a, an actor, you are an editor. You're always thinking, like, what, is the, what is captured in frame and what is out of frame and what does the frame look like? Framing is everything if you're in content. So, of course, I became very familiar with the framing. What look, what's behind me? What are the colors? What is the quality of the content? What logos would you not see? What's dress? What's hair? I don't wear any makeup. A lot of the content guys want you to wear makeup because the lights glare in your face. Just buy more expensive lights. By the way, if, anybody, if you go on a set to do a podcast, this is a sidebar. And they pull you aside and they go start putting makeup on you. This has happened to me a hundred times. And, and initially you don't know. They're like, yeah, the lights glare and they reflect on you. They start putting makeup on you, right? I don't wear makeup. And so like I pat their hand away and everything. And finally, I learned to say, I, I'm not wearing makeup. Go buy better lights. If you have great lights, you don't need the makeup. Jeff, is that fair? All right. Yeah, the reason the lights are glaring off your forehead is because they're cheap lights. Look at these beautiful. Thank you, Jeff. Beautiful lights coordinated by a producer who knows what he's doing with good camera lenses, you don't need to wear makeup. I don't wear makeup. That's, look at this face. It's not a, <laughs> this is not a makeup face. Anyway, framing, right? How do you look on camera and, and in, in these Zoom calls especially? What's behind you? What's in frame? What does it sound like? Everybody's buying this microphone here, this uh, Sony SMB, this SM7B mic. Is this the Shure? Yeah, the Shure. The Sony makes a good mic, too. Somebody stole my Sony mic. That's how much people think about mics. They come in here for a podcast, and they took my mic. Whoever took my $541 mic, bring it back. I miss it. But I guess I'll just buy another one. Buy stuff to make yourself look good, frames, and framing. How you look matters. And so we're doing this deal now. I'm building it as I can't imagine that if you're following me, you haven't heard this yet, but I'm building a multi-hundred million dollar factory in Texas and introducing some amazing Italian precision manufacturing technologies to the U.S. So they're breakthrough technologies. We have a product that we make that belongs in every American home. It's five to $25,000. It's like a 60% gross margin. And we're building, ultimately, working to build a billion dollar asset in 36 months from dead stop. How about that for a deal? As you can imagine, when I talk to potential investors, I just did a presentation this morning for Morning Brew. Talk about a thousand people, most of them CFOs, financial professionals coming in to see my presentation on the factory and how I think about investing. That, the camera and the framing and the makeup and the hair and everything, you know, it needs to look appropriate. It's not a, a, a Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo DiCaprio and Al Pacino in a pivotal scene. You don't have to look that good, but it has to look good. Frame 
and framing. So anyway, after the presentation, I think we did a good job, good cameras, good lighting, good content, and the Morning Brew was very happy, CFO Brew was very happy, one of the best show rates they've had, one of the best conversion rates they had, and we jumped people over to a Zoom, because when you're on that Morning Brew call, everybody can see you, but I can't see anybody, I can't have any two-way interaction. So I go, hey, let's do a Zoom call. One of the great things is I brought the CEO for our company to the Zoom call, and he's like, at his house with, and David, sorry if you're listening to this, I don't mean to be critical, but he's at his house, it's dim lighting, there's a lampshade in the background. It doesn't look like we're doing a $200 million anything, but now David knows what he's doing, he has all the content. And so I thought about it, we really got into this framing content high awareness when we weren't hard and heavy in a deal, right? Because what we were saying was so important David, is he's building a factory, he's doing operations, he wants $175,000 to paint the inside of the building. We gotta choose a color, it's $165,000. He's dealing with operations. He's not too worried about what the Zoom call looks like. And, we, and, and for years, we only worried about what the Zoom call, and these two worlds collided. Because I brought him to my investor call where everything looked beautiful, and then David comes in and of course, he's dim lighting from his laptop, and it doesn't look as mellifluous as the presentation that we're doing. Framing matters, and I think the other thing is you start to think about framing, the contrast in frame matters. So if you're bringing somebody on, they have a totally different framing, look, feel, uh, lighting, and everything that you have, people are gonna immediately be aware of that contrast uh, between uh, how you framed it and how, how you haven't framed it. And, and intro to the subject, frames and framing. Now, what we are looking at is, in a, is we're getting heavy into the election cycle. There's whatever, 100 days left to the election, whatever it is, you now have Kamala Harris, you now have Donald Trump, you now have J.D. Vance in the mix, we're gonna get a vice president elect uh, selection from Kamala Harris, there'll be a new name in it. What you are seeing today, if you have the chance to listen to the news, the most aggressive, most sophisticated, most advanced clinical framing exercises that you will see in American culture and society. So if you think about it, and I took some notes here, first of all, in, in framing, there's an order of things. So you, in order to make something look a certain way, which is what framing is. So if you have a product, you wanna make that product look a certain way against the competition. You wanna make that product look a certain way against the last generation of products. And you wanna make that thing look a certain way in terms of features, benefits, and value proposition. You wanna frame that product up. If you have a service, you wanna frame that service up and make it uh, seem very important. You wanna frame it up in time. You wanna frame it up in terms of money. You wanna frame it up in terms of where we are in the economic cycle. You wanna frame that thing up in terms of value. So those are all the frames that if you can't get around your product and service, then you have a problem in that the, the other people are framing their products and services. And when your frame and their frames run into each other, one frame is gonna win. And that is the underlying tenet between framing. Only one frame can exist around you, your product, your service, your political candidate. And so I'm gonna walk you through how these political, uh, you're gonna see this over and over again, how these political frames work. So number one, when you are framing a political candidate, say the opponent, the opposition, in a certain way, the step one, and so what you want them to do is ostensibly look bad. So if you are Trump and Vance, you want Harris to look bad. If you're Harris, you want Trump to look bad, and that requires you to frame them in a certain way. All right, so number one is you have to define normal. So when you go, unless you're a political candidate and you're running for, I don't know, your HOA organization, your local community, the, the president of your community, mayor of your town, I don't know what's higher than mayor. I don't know anything. Whatever exists between mayor and senator, I have no idea. I'm not involved in civil economics as much as I should be, but you're trying to run for mayor, you're trying to run for senator, you're trying to run for something, right? You have opposition. So uh, the, the exercise is to, is to frame and reframe the opposition. So number one, you wanna define normal. Again, if it's your product uh, or if it's the opposition, you wanna define normal. You know, what you think are the values and belief systems that everybody can agree to. So uh, let's see, what you, in, what's the case? Um, sure, so the Republicans are now working on a frame on Kamala Harris's laugh, right? So they've got, she's got a, distinctive laugh. Some people think it is uh, irritating. Some people don't mind it at all, right? But the first thing they're doing is, hey, there's, la there's a way to laugh normally. I don't know, Jeff, tell me a joke. A joke back there? All right, so anyway, that's, all right, that's good enough. Like, you can't hear Jeff, he's got a natural laugh, chuckled. All right, 
So, I, hey, Jeff, I think it's pretty funny that you can't come up with a joke on the spot. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we'll have to move. All right, so I got to laugh. I don't know if it's that irritating, but there's, but you, um, what they're trying to do here is say there's a normal way to laugh, and Kamala Harris is doing something weird outside the norm. You cannot paint somebody outside the norm unless you've defined the norm, right, and you have appropriated cultural evidence that the norm exists. So if you're selling a new product, so for example, we are selling engineered quartz. It is this beautiful new way of making countertops that look like stone, right? So in order to frame that product up, we have to frame stone up as beautiful, right? And that's our frame, because that's something, the reason we want to appropriate stone the way stone looks comes from a quarry, comes from Spain or Italy. It's mined and has this beautiful, rich veining and a translucent nature to it. And almost a, you can almost hear the, res, the resonance of the stone talking to you as the veins interplay in the natural way in which God and nature and the organicness of a million years of creating this incredible piece of rock that then can be, anyway. So we have to frame this as organic and beautiful and violin music in order so you can replace it with something that's more economical, something that is more uh, easy to use, something that is easier to get, something easier to specify and something that's more technical. You have to have a baseline that people agree with. Nobody's gonna disagree with me that quartz taken from the ground and mined and machined in the way the Italians do it, in the way that the Spanish do it, can create the most gorgeous countertops that you almost want to cry when you see them. So beautiful. I'm appropriating uh, sort of cultural standards that we can all agree to. So when they go after Harris's laugh, they're going to say, hey, there's like a normal way of laughing. They're going to show all these actors or actresses who are naturally charismatic. Their job is to be on screen and, and entertain you. And they're going to show normal. And then they're going to pick the most least adaptive to that normal and identify and, and show that and say that's weird against normal. And you can get that high contrast framing again. So same thing is when I have a beautiful frame, we have good cameras, we have soft lighting, we have a, a production engineer is showing me within camera frame for some content that I've developed and I switch to David and he's in his you know, living room with low lighting, that contrast of framing is immediately evident. So what they wanna do is they wanna show perfect, beautiful laughter, then get fr uh, Harris's frame or laughter, reframe it as weird because they now own the center line of normal. So that's step one, define normal. The second thing is, if you're gonna call something weird, give evidence that thing is weird. What I would do is, by the way, it's not an attack on Harris, it's not an attack on Trump, J.D. Vance, I don't know, attack him, not attack him, I don't care. But if I was then going to continue with this sort of line of attack and reframing, I would pull the most nefarious characters from entertainment and movies and TV and politics who had all weird laughs as we define it, right? And I would say, hey, look, see, this is weird and it's close to that. So now I own normal, which is the beautiful, charismatic actors and actresses in Hollywood and what we like to think as a form of laughter that is rich and resonant and interesting and charismatic. And then I'm gonna reframe this laugh as weird and then I'm gonna attach it to people who we just know they themselves would be weird, whether they laugh is weird or not, right? And that's a big reframing exercise. So I'm gonna give evidence that the thing that we're trying to reframe is weird, right? And then I'm gonna try and get it to stick. And the way I'm gonna get it to stick is to, is to be, have certainty around that story. Own that story, repeat that story until it has got enough exposure to it that people, the reframing is successful and they now feel like for sure that laugh is weird and therefore that person is weird like these other weird people. That's how the reframing exercise would go. Let's pick on someone else. J.D. Vance had this quote, hey, America is being run by childless cat, childless cat ladies, right? He said this on a, I forgot what show he said it on and I made a comment and I think there is some poignancy to it in the comment itself is that decisions about American culture are being made by people who don't have children. An American typically has a very community-based 
culture which has a church or a synagogue or something in the center of it, schools at the center of it, YMCA is at the center of it, community centers at that, community parks, those are filled with children and it's very, and it's just, if you look at the research, having a, a, a nuclear family organization with a mother and father, children in the family, and those children are active in the community, and those communities practice some kind of faith-based religion, and the, then that tends to build higher quality citizens, and why, that's why the United States of America has organized around that political and social structure in the way that we have evolved. That is starting to break now, and some of those standards are, and I think that's what J.D. Vance was trying to say, is that people without children are making decisions about our country when they don't necessarily have their own family stakes attached to those decisions. And I have an appreciation for that. His choice of words, terrible. Childless cat ladies, probably not the right way to bring that point home, but he was, he was on a TV show trying to say something funny. He wasn't running for president or vice president at the time, so obviously that unfolded, and it was a big laugh by everybody on a right-wing show, and now he's eating crow for having said that. So what the now Democrats are going to do is try and frame that, go hard in the paint, and try and frame that as him being a insensitive, hard right wing, unappreciative of the current family flexibility. I don't want to get into its structures in the United States, and it has some insensitivity to it. And then obviously there are people who have tried very hard to have children, and they haven't been able to. They shouldn't be get thrown in a J.D. Vance cat lady comment. But so then how do we then reframe J.D. Vance as weird, right? Let's go through the process. We got to define normal. Normal is somebody in the United States that we, we just believe that people who are reasonable, that are not geared to be hyper-expressive in their emotions and not critical of people that they don't know and not empathetic of other people's situations, especially when they don't know them. That is what we teach our children. That is what we teach in schools. If somebody is acting outside of that norm, whether they're in a school, a middle school, a junior school, high school, college, then what happens is like the system tries to either fix their behavior because that is, or ostracizes them. We like to be reasonable in our culture and that's what makes it work and that's what makes it admired. We can still be successful. We can still be an economic powerhouse. We can still have a $13 trillion consumer economy, the most cashed up consumer in the world, the best research universities in the world. People send their kids to our universities. We don't send our kids to universities in China or Switzerland or anywhere else in the world unless it's like summer at sea or whatever. People want what we have because we're able to have a rich, very strong economy and still be reasonable people who consider both sides of an argument. So now all I have to do is define normal as somebody who's reasonable, considers both sides of an argument, and doesn't criticize people who they don't know and have never met. Then I gotta give evidence of weirdness to get J.D. Vance to seem weird. The evidence is there from the show. I just gotta play clips from the show, and now I gotta go through other stuff that he said on other shows and find additional evidence that J.D. Vance says some weird, super right-wing things. And then the next step I have to do is trying to get that stuff to stick. If you watch the news cycle, this has happened to you in real time on these two subjects. Watch them unfold, see which one sticks, see which one doesn't, and you can watch framing happen in absolute real time. So then we get to Trump, right? And Trump has done a very good job of, so we say, hey, we, the first step in reframing is to define normal. What Trump have obviously succeeded in is redefining normal. There's nothing, he doesn't do anything normal from hair, skin color, cadence of speaking, lack of detail, lack of what I would say is corroborated information. It's just the arguments he gets into and the things, the type of issues that he sticks himself into that are unnecessary to get into in the first place. And so he has just completely redefined normal for a politician. So uh, for him, it's very difficult to then say, hey, let's define normal. So if I was going to throw some stuff on Trump, I would look, I would, def since he has redefined normal, I'm just thinking through this issue now, if I had to do it right on the fly and I was in a PAC or a political executive committee, I don't have prepared notes on this at all. But if I had to think about how do I get Trump redefined? I think we do it this way. We say, America, we have, we get celebrities who get such notoriety that they break the things that we consider normal, that if somebody in our home did it, if somebody of our family did it, if somebody at our work did it, it would be considered abnormal. But for this person, they get special dispensation, right? And no, I, I, w I wouldn't say, so I would say, 
it, culturally, it is normal for people with high celebrity to have their behavior, as odd as it is, considered to be normal, right? What is weird is when that person who can say anything, do anything that completely colors outside the lines, starts coloring inside the lines, right? And then I would go grab a bunch of stuff that Trump is saying today that's normal, right? And then I would go find lots of situations when Russia got the A-bomb, right? They started acting very normal. Somebody who found, he was walking down the street, found a wallet, opened the wallet, it's got a couple thousand dollars in it, they stick it in their pocket, and now they're acting super normal, almost like whistling, saying hi to people, and being obtusely normal. And so I'd go find a situation, like when Russia got the A-bomb, they started acting incredibly normal, published in a normal way, and started behaving less with the bravado that they're used to. That's one example I can think of. Another example I can think of somebody who can say or do anything in a very wild way and then just started acting normal. I think potentially Elon Musk with Tesla, right? During the run up to Tesla, smoking weed with Joe Rogan on, on podcasts. As Tesla got competition, stock had some pressure on it. Some of the product releases were delayed and now electric vehicles are not on the high that they have before. Twitter is under a lot of pressure. You're starting to see Elon Musk behave in much more normal ways. So I would come back and say, in, in, in essence, flip the script, right? What was crazy is now normal, that's concerning, and I would paint him with the normal brush. So this is, you're gonna see this unfold in the political cycle. I want you to think about framing your product. But let's stay out of this sort of, uh, if you wanna stay out of the political riffraff and just think about, hey, I have a software product, I have a service, I'm a law firm, right? Define normal for you, reframe the competition by uh, finding something that they, they, they do that's odd, make that weirdness stick to them, find other examples of that weirdness to stick them to, and then stick to your story that they're weird and you are behaving and your product has features, benefits, value proposition that are normal for today's, for the market that we're in. And that is the, what I would say, the clear choice that people should be making because the other choice of competition is quite weird at the moment. Own normal. All right, so those are my thoughts on framing. And let's see, this then is old school pitch anything as we have been talking about. This broadcast generally is not sponsored by anybody. That's why you get to hear the stuff direct from me at the pace you get to hear it. This has been the Game of Money broadcast. I'll talk to you next week about more. I think we're going to talk about money issues, a couple examples of companies that are, have been doing some crazy things and been rewarded for doing crazy. Let's unpack that why and how and what's happening in this economic cycle. Talk to you next week on The Game of Money.